My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Members to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I'm speaking with Rudy Reyes. He is an American conservationist, martial arts instructor, actor, and former active duty United States Marine. He is best known for portraying himself in the HBO TV miniseries, Generation Kill. So Rudy got his start with the Marine Corps back in 1998 and was ultimately selected for and, and passed, you know, ended up becoming a force recon Marine. Uh, he served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and on board the USS Dubuque. After leaving the military in 2005, Reyes became a fitness trainer at a gym in San Diego. His acting roles included playing himself in Generation Kill, like I said, and uh, the TV series Apocalypse Man, Ultimate Survival Alaska, and Spartan Race. One of the things that uh, I've been able to talk with Rudy about, and one of the things that we're going to discuss on here, is the uh, conservation efforts that he, his, his uh, uh, conservation team that he put together is the Force Blue team. We'll talk a little bit about that, but it's a bunch of uh, special ops people from the different branches of the military that get together and work to rebuild and restore coral reefs. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, your book, Rudy, Hero Living, Seven Strides to Awaken Your Infinite Power. I, um, I'm, I'm really curious about that because uh, you seem to be pretty spiritual, um, even like watching uh, Generation Kill and kind of getting a sense of your, your character in, in that show where you're playing yourself um, yeah. kind of uh, you've got kind of a reputation of being like a, an Adonis type, you know? <laughs> yes. And, and, and always practicing my Zen Buddhism. The reason why is, well, those first, well, every war I went to was so heavy. It was so heavy. And the first two, combat deployments were expeditionary so we never knew when we were going to come home and the second one I did we were leading the invasion in gas masks and mop suits so I was really trying to prepare my for my death and 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 therefore not be uh, ha not have anxiety about holding on to my life so that it got in the way of my combat operations because I understood the only way forward to live would be to address my death, which would be to practice as much meditation in everything I did to be here now. It was just, um, it, may be, it may sound strange on the surface, but, uh, but so I practiced my Zen Buddhism in everything I did to include my martial arts and include cleaning my weapon and to include how I laced up my boots and, and even chanting behind the scope. So, um, so that I was as relaxed as possible because I'm a scout sniper as well. So my heartbeat was relaxed so I could shoot those long shots. Um, yeah. And I guess maybe to an American audience and to the reporter, the reporter, the reporter was an American douchebag um, that uh, jumped onto the story of a lifetime. He was nobody before, and now he's kind of somebody. But to a nihilist and a borderline anti-American reporter who at first thought that all of us devil dogs were the lowest common denominator of America, and that's why we're fighting, because we have nothing else going on in our lives, 
that kind of attitude and disdain I picked up on immediately. But of course, he was uh, he was rudely awakened to realize that that our men were the finest in the world. The some of the most hyper intelligent, of course, great athletes. You know, you have to imagine the lands in which this kind of quasi and he's very pro-American now after he, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try not to curse, but after we freaking saved his freaking ass over and over and over or when the freaking bullets and, and uh, mortars and RPGs were coming in, he damn sure learned to love the Marine Corps and he loves the Marine Corps now. Uh, but at the time, remember, he came into the barracks as we were staged for months uh, training and um, and doing probing missions on the border uh, of Kuwait and and um, and uh, uh, Iraq and and so yeah um, you know he was a porn writer before he came to Rolling Stone he landed in the story of a lifetime which became a best selling book which became a Emmy award winning uh, a television show for HBO. It was very interesting. And it was very interesting, brother, for me to portray someone that I no longer was. Because I went back to fight in Fallujah and Ramadi after that. And I was a team leader. I was a team leader in the invasion. My team leader was shot right next to me. I had to take over and get back into the battle, get him on a, on a bird and, and get him some of this. All he asked is for this and his watch cap. And, uh, and, you know, I was fucking crying a little bit inside. He was my fucking hero. And I was scared to death now running a four man, three man team, including myself. And we never know when we're coming home or, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, by then and then and then by Fallujah and Ramadi, I was not that same. A more balanced and more loving person. You know, by the time I got to production, I was hard. And so it was different for me to have to read a script with dialogue that someone else wrote for me and then play a character. And at first I felt very stiff. Sometimes, uh, although I was a sergeant portrayed there, the, the actors that were, you know, staff sergeants or lieutenant colonels or, or the, the actor who's a good friend of mine, um, Alexander Skarsgård, he, he was playing a senior sergeant. It was difficult for me to even, it was difficult for me to even look eye to eye with anybody because I felt so dominant and angry that I couldn't be dominant. And, and all these things were going on inside. I had no time to process anything, brother. We talked about PTSD earlier before. I'd go into combat, combat, combat. After Fallujah and Ramadi, which are the, were the most dangerous places in the world. You know, the Battle of Fallujah is recognized as our Battle of Way City of Vietnam and, and even tougher. Um, it may be the most important battle the United States has fought in, in 50 years. And I, I'd only been out of the Marine Corps. I, I got home and only two weeks later, I was out of the Marine Corps. And, um, and I went right to work. I went right, right into complete obsession with work and activity. Oh, brother, and, and on top of seven or eight hours of teaching boxing and kickboxing every day, which I led every class. Then I still worked out every day. I was just obsessed because I had all this energy from being in war for so long. And then I get a chance to go to Generation Kill. And in some way it was therapy, like I was filming my war again, but also in rock and, and I was a military advisor. The, the actors look shit hot, the gear shit hot, um, their immediate action, their movements, everything. I mean, I trained them for six weeks uh, beforehand, uh, culminating with the final mission, real world mission out in freaking uh, 
Namibia. And then one of the Humvees on patrol at night to get to the freaking release point, freaking caught on fire. They thought it was part of the thing. No, it really caught on fire. We had to do a bump plan. We, I mean, it was full meal deal, you know, with freaking blanks and simunitions and, and Artie and my stunt crew led by Daniel Hurst, uh, British Army. He was uh, our, our op oppositional forces. And it was rad. So these men were in it. Uh, and, and so I was now reliving my war, but every time you say cut, the lovely African women, South African women uh, running freaking espresso to me and in the Humvee with my weapon. Can you imagine how strange all that was? You know? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we dove right in. I kind of, <laughs> like, I wanna, I wanna ask you some questions Sure. You know, you you were uh, well. Let me just ask: Where were you born and raised? Well, brother, I was born in Richard Gabauer's air base. Um, my father was a marine, and I just went through a little of my. We talked about PTSD the other day or, or earlier today, and. I had to reach out to my ex-wife yesterday because I've got some new passport information for my fiance and I to get to London to do this uh, press junket for SAS Who Dares Wins. That's my next big project. And it's massive. Uh, I already shot two seasons, two seasons in Jordan. I go back to Jordan to do an American season. Fox has picked this up. Then I go right to Vietnam to do two more seasons uh, for the UK. And I had to uh, call my ex-wife. I haven't talked to her in seven uh, years. And it, it, it brought up things like my whole life that I have just, or I thought I've just outworked and defeated um, because I was fighting it. Um, uh, I, grew, I grew up all over the Midwest uh, my biological father was a Marine as well. The man who gave me his name, Rudy Reyes Sr., and I love him so much, he's passed on. They both have passed on. Uh, he was a Marine and he was in love with my mother so much, even though she had somebody else's baby in her stomach, he married her. For that reason, she was up visiting her mother who got away from uh, my uh, very abusive and destructive grandfather. We all came, my family's all, uh, migrant workers from McAllen and the border of Texas, right? South Texas. Uh, poor, um, sad, angry, and the men were very abusive. But my father was, my father, Rudy Reyes Sr. was not. He used all that abuse because he was poorer than even my mother's family. Uh, but he did the right thing and joined the Marine Corps and fought in Vietnam. And when he came home, um, scrubbed uh, grain silos to put food on the table until he could get on with the with the police department. And he immersed himself in police work, and that that was his PTSD therapy. And he never really got therapy; he just had to be in the fight, right? And he was in the fight his whole life until he died. He died very young. Uh, so uh, my mom left him uh, after uh, she had two more sons, Michael and Caesar, my brothers. We're all only a year and a half uh, apart. And then we moved to Kansas City to her mother, her mother. So we had a great suburban life till I was about seven years old until she died. Uh, she was a Mexican American woman that uh, got a divorce, which almost never happened and went to school and she became a nurse. She provided very well for us. Uh, my mother was not educated. I think she was only 17 when she had me and she's not educated, like maybe fifth grade education. Grew up in the fields, work in the fields, all the way up to Michigan and down. And uh, what, what, what illegal um, uh, migrants do now, that's what we did, right? Uh, so uh, um, after a really great life till about seven, with mixed in with some hard stuff down on the border. I remember my father, my, my grandfather hated my father, Rudy Ray Sr. And little did I know, everybody in the family knew I was a bastard. I never knew until I was 11 years old 
Uh, and I was always wondering why people treated me like different and, and bad. And, I, and I'm more fair skinned than a lot of my uh, Mexican relatives, you see? And uh, I was just a little different uh, because my biological father is actually a Spaniard and German from Mexico, but wealthy and elite. Um, he became a heroin addict after a second tour in Vietnam and never worked again. And the family was so wealthy, they just put him in a house and, and he just died eventually early fifties and uh, just did heroin the rest of his life. But before he was sick, I, I did get to meet my family, the Delayatas, all very educated, um, look as European as you and I, even more so, green eyes, blue eyes, blonde hair, and um, uh, amazing. My, my cousin's the dis district attorney in Austin. My, his father, my uncle, is a, a, a double professor at University of Texas. Um, I have a beautiful sister, a half sister, who is a, a doctor as well. So I had these genes, unbeknownst to myself, right? Um, but uh, uh, my father, I remember my, my father was fighting, or my, my grandfather was saying abusive stuff to my mom. I was about three or four. And I just saw her on the bed crying. The bed was so high, right? So it was a little climbed up there. And I, re I remember the hummingbirds um, outside uh, the window and she was crying. And then I heard some, some yelling outside and I went running out there and there was my grandfather, the scumbag that he is uh, with his knife out. And my dad, Rudy Reyes Sr. with his fucking 357 out. And I remember grabbing my dad's leg, you know, and it, it was just tumultuous as all get out until we got to Kansas City when I was about four. And uh, by five, six, seven years old, I had a great education. I would say it carried me for the rest of my life because I went to a good school. Um, I had a bicycle. Uh, I had Christmas. I had church clothes. It was a great life until then. And when my um, grandmother died, my um my mother just took that money and, and by then she had developed a, a drug habit and was always with bad guys. And um, we just moved around wherever and sometimes at cousin's house, uncle's house. Um, and then ultimately in the Omaha home for boys. She gave my brother Caesar, Michael and I up to the boys home out of state so that she could still collect her welfare go, that was going to her guy. And so that's how I grew up. But I will tell you, for an American, it was a pretty, it's pretty tough. However, only in America do we have boys' homes where you can go to. Uh, I, we, we were neglected, my brothers and I, and so I had uh, rot through all my teeth. And like, these are fake teeth, you know, um, and rot behind my eye. They had to freaking cut my mouth open and, and, and drain all this stuff out. I was on antibiotics. And had hepatitis by then, not to mention Michael and Caesar and I had worms and, um, and lice. They put me in the hospital. They gave me some freaking pride of having some teeth. I never smiled before them. I was so embarrassed. And uh, they gave me a weight pile. They gave me a wrestling team. And they said, you follow the rules. You work in the boys' home. You do good in school with good grades. And you can freaking compete. And... Uh, and is it still tough in the boys' home? Hell yeah. You're fighting the boys all the time until you figure out where you stand. Um, everybody there is sad in some way because their orphans are thrown away. A lot of people don't know this, and it should be said with all this talk right now about racism and, and, uh, and privilege. Uh, primarily, the boys there were white boys because they were given up by good families when all the farms had failed in 1983, 84, 85, and farm boys, farm boys and, and, and good parents, they couldn't afford their kids. And so it was a lot of white boys. We had, we had of course, some black kids, but a few Latinos. Uh, we even had a few Jewish kids um, because there was a massive crash and they didn't have any money either. Um, I'll tell you what, the, uh, those, those tough uh, wrestling, uh, hard working, sad white boys. They weren't privileged. So uh, I grew up. I grew up there, brother. And uh, 
Got to see Haley's Comet. Got to wrestle. I was undefeated my eighth grade year. Uh, learn, learned to fight. Had a black kid from uh, Kansas City as well. His name's Gabriel Gordon. I was the best wrestler at my weight class and even above. I always wrestled uh, heavier guys. Um, his name is Gabriel Gordon and he was a jokester, but he'd grown up boxing since he was five. So, hey man, you want to box, Rudy? I'm like, sure, I'll box. Put on the boxing gloves in the rec center, right? And I'm freaking banging him and I'm banging him, I'm banging him. But he's just covering up and he just gave me one uppercut, boom, right in the lips. Fucking swole up my lips. And I said, okay. So I really started going hard at him. And then like he hit me with the one, two, a jab, right? Bam. He, he busted me up. I threw off those gloves. So we're going to fight for real. And he's like, no, man, I thought we was just boxing. And then I, after I calmed down, I realized he schooled the shit out of me. I said, could you teach me how to do that? Could you teach? And so, I mean, you know, uh, only, only in America do we have even institutions. Because later when I would fight throughout the Middle East, later when I would fight throughout North Africa, they did not have those things. When I was out in Hong Kong and the Far East, they did not have those things. When I was in Mongolia, not have, they did not have the infrastructure and the care and the progression that we have had here in the United States that no one in the world has had. So I'm very thankful. And that's why I'm very, very, very proud of my country and very patriotic. What I read... And actually, you know, through hearing you speak, um, you you emancipated yourself. You uh, you raised your your brothers, and you actually I, I don't know how old you were when you started taking kung fu, but you ended up teaching martial arts. Was it kung fu that you were teaching? It was. It was kung fu. Uh, we had the white man brother. I, I was such a good boy was such a good young man and it had to do with the boys home it had to do with you know like you know like I, I i i have i have my reminders you know everywhere you know if you look at my house you see my action figures uh you see my my team photos and my medals um i grew up reading comic books and believing in heroes because when my life was really hard it was the only thing i could believe in it gave me some sense of, um, of right and wrong. And uh, so when I got out of the boys' home and I got Michael and Caesar to li live with me in my little apartment in the freaking rough-ass neighborhood in Kansas City, we were in, um, we were in uh, Midtown. We were caught in the middle of the freaking Rodney King riots. I mean, it was heavy. Uh, no car. We, were walk we had to walk to the restaurant where we bust tables and wash dishes. And there was a YMCA for a family membership. And because we were poor for $20 a freaking month, we could work out and downstairs, uh, Sifu John Reader was teaching Kung Fu and the rest is history, baby. We went downstairs. Actually, my little brother Caesar went down, who's very talented. He's a chef now. He went downstairs and in one class learned a few sweeps. And then the, and he never had the patience to lift weights. So that night when we went back home, I asked him, you know, what, what he learned and stuff. And he swept me and did some rad stuff. I was like, holy smokes. So the next class I was there and Michael and Caesar and I trained there um, for years. And, and then I moved and then Michael and I moved on to this Chinese gentleman, Chu Man Sit. And, and then we trained with China's national team. I trained with the Shaolin monks. Uh, it was just incredible. But the boys had to go train and they had to work. It was so rough back then, brother, with crack and, and heroin on the street and crime. Uh, a lot of these young people, well, the young people, if they listen to it now, if they could imagine how the inner cities are now, that's the way it was then, but maybe even worse. Um, uh, the inner city, the black community, especially due to the crack ep ep epidemic, uh, was just crashing. Um, and we lived, we had to live in the black neighborhood. It was the only place I could afford. And, um, and I kept the boys uh, off the streets. Um, I took them to school, but the schools were so gang affiliated 
they were forced and threatened to join the gang. I had to get them out of school and put them into a GED program. And, um, and then I kept this working and training. And, uh, and I had no idea really until now as an older, you know, I'm 50 years old now. Um, what a benefit that was for those boys. You know what I'm saying? One of the things that, uh, that we had talked about, you know, you, you ended up joining the Marine Corps and I'm curious if you had always had aspirations to go into special operations or if you uh, were introduced to it and said, oh, I got to do that shit. Yeah. Well, I always loved the Marine Corps because I, I, I'm an illustrator and a painter, too. And the, the first human drawing I did was of Rudy Reyes Sr., uh, my dad's dress blue photograph when I was about six and I was working real hard on the foreshortening of how to how to draw grim you know your your mind's trying to figure out spatial awareness and I made sure every button was right and everything and uh I just always knew in the way and my dad was so patriotic and so gung ho uh, I always loved the Marine Corps I always loved it, and but but in in my early adulthood, I was also a little bit I was a little bit con, you know, afraid that what would happen to me would happen to them, or what would happen to me is what happened to them, and I and also I did not like guns um, because I saw guns on the street, and my cousins had been killed, my uncles had been killed some of my cousins and some of my extraneous family had killed other people. People in, in my family are in and out of prison. Um, so maybe that's why I really perfected martial art where I could fight, but also fight in a ring with rules and, and not want to kill my opponent. Um, however, I'm also, you know, I'm a, I'm a humanist and I saw a documentary about children in a freaking orphanage in Yugoslavia, Serbia and Croatia were fighting and uh, all the adults were being killed. And it was some Americans over there that started this orphanage in a blown out building between the sniper alleys. And I was so moved by it. Um, but, and in that week before going to the Nelson Atkins where I trained, um, I'd always train outdoors. By then, I trained in the snow. I trained in the heat. I trained outdoors to feel the stimulus and the pain. And uh, I would practice my wrestling and my takedowns against uh, some of the sapling trees to build that power. On my way, I saw in the USA Today, and young people probably don't remember these times. We used to read newspapers. And uh, I saw in the USA Today that, that President Clinton was gonna put boots on the ground. Right there, I was moved. I, I, I went to the recruiter and I got a brochure and I thought about it and I was dreaming about it, then reading about it. And then around that time, uh, Stephen Pressfield's Gates of Fire and Frank Miller's 300 came out and I'm reading about the Spartans and I'm watching the Spartans. And, and, and then I said, okay, I have to do this. I have to do it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I have, but it, honor, courage, commitment. Awesome. Okay. I'm all in. That's why I did it. And I had no idea about special operations yet. Uh, I joined as an infantryman. And, um, and even though when I did the ASVAB and everything like that, they, uh, they wanted me to be a helicopter mechanic because I had a little bit of brains. But I, I remember talking to my recruiter, his name, he was a gunny. He was Latino from the border, um, and uh, he was infantry, and his face was full of scars. He fought in Somalia and Desert Storm, and he's like, uh, you know, Rudy, uh, it's, a, it's a hard life. I'm letting you know it's a real hard life. And I said, well, isn't the Marine Corps, I mean, isn't that, Marine Corps only does two things, make Marines and win battles. Well, I got to win battles, right? I said, all right, all right, that's really what you want. I said, that's what I want. So that's how it started. That's how it started, brother. So how were you introduced to uh, Force Recon? 
Well, the recon Marines came through the end of my boot camp with this rad video. Wait, before then, um, uh, Aliente, Gunny Aliente, he showed me in a VHS in his office this film, it's somewhere out there, it's called Behind Enemy Lines about this rad recon team doing freaking amphib insert at night, freaking cutting the wires, patrolling in, freaking setting up uh, uh, fields of fire and, and then uh, uh, attacking a freaking base. And, uh, and I, I remember saying, damn, that's good shit, you know? But I didn't think I could do it because I, I'd never really swam in the ocean. I'd never done any of that stuff, right? Um, and, and I was uh, the honor grad and Ironman of, of boot camp and school of infantry. Very fit, very, very fit and very motivated. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, no, no dip yet. Um, so freaking, you know, well, you, if you think about it, a 26 year old, a, um, a young man with no vices and has built his life on fitness, they're, they're, a, uh, they're quite a force, right? But I didn't know how to swim. After whooping ass at my first six months of the Marine Corps, and by the way, uh, being punished for it, they gave me the shittiest details. After school of infantry, a super squad freaking meritoriously promoted. Uh, I had so many awards, I couldn't even hold them all. Um, uh, they put me on camp guard and it was the hardest freaking duty, you know, trying to keep these young Marines from escaping and going UA and running to Mexico or whatever and, and, and uh, doing reliefs for guards. And I lived in the squad bay. I hardly even saw the sunlight. So all I did is push ups and jump rope and pull ups because they had a pull up bar. And I didn't know when I was going to get to a unit. But recon came through at Horno, it was at 1 1, and they were running an in dock. And um, the corporal, the guard, uh, and back then rank was not easy to make. He'd already been in five years and he was a corporal. He mentioned to the recon Marine, Sergeant Sparks, that he's got a young guy, you know, he's got a young fired up Marine that would be good for recon. And, and uh, so he announced it in front of all my freaking boys from boot camp and SOI. They still called me guide. And they're like, and then I'm hearing cheering from my boys going, guide can do it. Guide's going to be recon, all this. I was hiding out at the racks and feeling freaking uh, anxiety because I really couldn't swim. And, um, and I really didn't know anything about that stuff. And I was not overconfident, but I was so, I was more bothered by the shame of not trying out than saying, I'm not gonna do it. And uh, so that at 0430, they picked me up in the bus and I uh, went to the P PFT um, start. All the other cats uh, trying out for recon were sergeants, staff sergeants, uh, captains, cats that have been in eight years. I went to school with a legend named Kruger who had been in 10 years. He was a sergeant. He was a scout sniper and a ranger. Uh, these cats had been in combat. They were hard. They were mean. Uh, they all looked at me like I didn't rate and maybe I didn't, but I was so dominant. Number one on the PFT, smoked through the freaking uh, obstacle courses, smashed the exercises, ruck run, number one, uh, 30 minutes ahead of anybody else at the pool while I'm just trying to gather my courage for this shit. Because, you know, they're treading with that freaking rifle over your head with freaking camis and 500 meter swim, drown proofing, abandoned ship drill. And then this was the hardest thing in my life I've ever done. Uh, 30 minutes of treading water. I was, I was probably putting out the effort of of like an of like a 24 hours treading water. I mean, I was just going like this, just trying to breathe, right? But they could tell how dominant I was at everything. And there was given everything I could. And they attacked me a few times. They got sharks down in there. Um, 
And when I finally freaking made it, I had to get to take off my trousers, make my life preserver, lean back for 10 minutes, and then get out and freaking run that next six mile slick. Uh, I got a seat. I got a seat to freaking amphibious reconnaissance school and the East Coast. It does not exist anymore. It was known as the last man school of the Marine Corps. And, uh, and it was very, very hard. And, and somehow I made it through that freaking three month freaking meat grinder just to go to a unit and then go right into freaking, oh, going right back to guard duty, even though now I'm in 0321, uh, still motivated as hell. Uh, and then after that dive school, um, um, scout sniper, seer, jump, all kinds of rad stuff for years to develop me as a basically trained recon Marine. And uh, on my very first deployment on the Dubuque, uh, as a corporal, the towers were hit. And so my freaking stony ass recon brothers and a platoon of SEALs and 1-1, one, one, the grunts, uh, we invaded Pakistan and then Afghanistan. And that was the first heavy stuff we'd done since Somalia. We, we were talking a little bit before we started recording. And then, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, you were talking about your, your Zen mindset. And I was wondering, as a child, were you introduced to Buddhism or? You know were... what? I was in, it was so fascinated by Buddhism because um, my dad took me to see the Bruce Lee movies and the martial art and the sense of courage and peace Bruce Lee had showed in his, in his fighting and is everything, this centered peacefulness, albeit ready to do violence. And then always, and, and then Daredevil and, uh, and Wolverine were both trained in the East. Daredevil's master was Stick. Uh, uh, the, the storybooks and the comic books uh, it fascinated me. And so I had always been driven that way. And when I started doing Chinese martial arts and specifically Chun Man Sit, how he worked <laughs> Buddhism with me is by telling me not to do it. And then of course I did it. And then he uh, started with meditation and whatever assignment of meditation he gave me, I double it. Whatever drills, fighting drills, I double it. And after a few years, our first competition, I really just wasted everybody in hand in in uh, empty hand sets, uh, two man weapon sets, fencing, wrestling, and then kickboxing. And I beat everybody: the Germans, the Chinese, the Russians. And I didn't even think I was that good. It was all the training. It was all the practice and the incredible work ethic uh, and, uh, that Chun Man Sit taught me. Um, and I was just a, an incredible student. On the, every chance I can, I would go to the Barnes and Noble and read every philosophy book and martial art book I could. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was obsessed and uh, I, w I became a vegetarian. I, I, I'd been lifting weights and I was strong. Uh, my, my teacher Chun Man Sit um, and how cool is the name of his, of his style? Six elbows, but now his school is known as evidence-based Tai Chi. So no hoopla, it's got to work, right? Uh, uh, I, just, uh, I just outworked everybody and uh, I, I was doing forms for a while. And he said, that's really not for you. You're going to work on three punches each side. Um, you're going to do three kicks each side, uh, three takedowns, and you're going to, and you're going to have an answer for the wrestling. You're going to have an, and I was already a wrestler. You're going to have an answer for the takedown. And, um, and, and he, the first time we sparred, he beat me effortlessly, small Chinese man, 45 years old. He said I was too slow because I was too tense and I was a little too heavy. So from then, and now it's all the rage, I started training only with rubber bands and plyometrics. Track, track drills, rubber bands, 
and massive amounts of drills. Um, and, um, and yeah, but, and, and then, and then I started competing and, but still, uh, it was after I saw that, that newspaper article, I knew there was something more and really, I didn't even really like after a while beating up my opponents. Um, it, it almost wasn't fair. And, and I asked myself, what am I doing this for? And I, I guess I'd hit kind of a zenith in my heart. And I was never a prize fighter. I didn't, I, I didn't have the mentality to want to be a prize fighter. All my medals and, and, and prize money, all of that went right back into training. I would always go to other masters to train. My, my teacher was very avant-garde. He connected me to boxers and other high-end Chinese Kung Fu people and karate people. And his favorite example of the finest Kung Fu or martial arts that he's seen was Muhammad Ali. And he would say, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali looked like he having fun, but when the, they sit down, the other guy all beat up. <laughs> you know, the younger Muhammad Ali was just so snappy and could control distance and he never got tired. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I knew there was something more if I wanted to prove myself in combat. It wasn't because I wanted to go whoop ass. It's did I have the courage to face the death and do the right thing? And it had always been in my mind. It, it was interesting. One of the things that you, you said, um, you, were, you were playing a character it was you a younger you <laughs> yeah that was uh you know in this place of zen that you had yes. um you know found this place where you were ready for death and uh and it, it's interesting because like there's that stoic philosophy side of that the eastern philosophy yes uh, the buddhist it's yes. uh to, to be able to truly live, you have to first know how to die, you know? It's so true. And, and I, um, I'm curious if, well, would you mind talking through the, the process of, well, there was that, that initial invasion where you guys went in wearing mop suits, gas masks and all that, but then that was just the start of it. And then, you know, you're, you're doing missions in Afghanistan or uh, you go to Fallujah and Ramadi and, and that was, uh, would you say those battles were the, the point in your life that really changed you? Yes, there was a market change. Um, I had already started changing by the invasion after the blood and guts and, and the destruction and the power. And it started, and, and by then, uh, my nervous system and metabolism was changed too. Um, it, it, I started changing physiologically. But uh, by the time I got to Fallujah and Ramadi, and I was, I'd be an instructor in between teaching and training other young men and they and some of these young men went on to become stars and recon and Marsoc. Marsoc would be developed later thanks to us thanks to what we did in recon um man it was so heavy it was so heavy when we got there to the built-up base camp Fallujah. it was called the mech there was a big uh, there was a m massive difference between us, my company. It, it, we were called a battalion in uh, name, but really we were just a company. We were like three platoons of men. We got there and it was mostly the Army and the Air Force, primarily the Army. Uh, they were tired. Their head was not in the game. They were uh, reactive and... casual. Uh, I recognize then also how much more training and experience we had and our culture is just 
aggressive, truly aggressive, which is a lifesaver in war. Aggression is a lifesaver in war. Can you imagine I'm doing left seat, right seat in Humvees with, I believe the 82nd Airborne, it might be the 101st. I think it was the 82nd. And their command, their doctrine was to drive as fast as they could wherever they had to, to never leave the base if they didn't have to, and let the Iraqis kill themselves or or if we have to, we can fight them and just do whatever you can to get home. My guys and I were like, you know, what the fuck are you guys talking about? Their gear looked like shit. They looked like shit. Uh, they were soft. Um, all of us were freaking meat eaters and predators. Every, every, there wasn't a single weak fuck recon guy. I mean, everybody was savage. Uh, even the young kids, because that's the culture that they were in. So we're at this place called the Viper ASP, a massive ammo dump, that little power station. So much ammo and explosives there from Saddam's time. The insurgents were just coming in there uh, with no problem taking it and then building bombs and blowing up the army, IEDs and, and um, uh, all, all hosts of IEDs. There was a uh, trailer-sized prefab building chow hall there, and the Blackwater contingent was there in the morning. Now, all of us recon Marines, always full kit, M4s, always ready to go, clean, sniper systems, a minimum six mags on us, even at whatever, we're ready. Soldiers were beat down. The Blackwater cats were um, overconfident in their Under Armour t-shirts and uh, in their long hair and beards. Even one of their guys was out of shape. I remember him, a fat guy with, with a black t-shirt on. And, and I, my team leader, Eric and I, we looked at each other like, who are these clowns? Of course, there were SEALs and Green Berets or whatever, but they were clowns. That morning, I'm doing, after we eat, and by the way, I hardly ever eat during the day. I'll eat a couple of bites because I need my blood to be in my muscles and in my brain. Um, I, I, need, I, I need that. At night, when I can relax, then I will eat. Um, we get left seat, right seat with the 82nd. Over the radio, we hear that some contractors are in contact. Then on the radio, we hear CAG Delta is doing a hard hit and they need blocking position. My commander says, we're going. The army's commanders are like, wait. And he says, no, we're going. We get to this ville, Al Karma, out, right outside of Fallujah. And there's like a massive riot happening. It's now about 10 hundred noon. Now the black waters are hit, killed, and being strung up on that freaking bridge. This is all kinetic. It's happening this fast. We dismount, set up our, um, our man pack machine guns. All our heavy guns are dialed in. And all of the snipers got our sniper systems out. Every freaking man has got uh, cover and uh, in shooting positions, ready to rock. The army is all hiding out in their freaking Humvees. CAG comes in in modded out Humvees with like armor in the back, almost like a pickup truck. And they're standing up and they look cool as hell. And they got their cool shit on. And then little birds come in for CAS or to, 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 to drop off a raid force. Right five, 600 meters away, boom, a heat seeking missile system blows this freaking helicopter right out of the sky above me. The arm, to include CAG, was in shock. My recon Marines and I lit that bill up, smashed it with everything we had. And this was 
Oh, oh, and this is after uh, mortars and rockets had come into our base, maybe the second day they were there, hit um, a medical triage area, killed a doctor, my commander and I running in, saving people. We knew the score. Everybody else was interested in getting out of there. And after that, it just got hotter and hotter. And, and shortly after that, I was on uh, sniper missions, doing heavy stuff, uh, using clandestine insertion methods. Uh, on my way of being extracted after three days, I was hit. The RPG, since we had no armored uh, Humvees, only half doors, uh, so that we could shoot and look. The RPG passed behind my head, right in front of the gooseneck of my, my heavy gunner's heavy gun exploded here but right before that and i was exhausted i hadn't slept in three days where i was still camied up and had vegetation on me i was in the reeds uh i saw two civilians running i just knew something was up and as i look boom boom and and nonchalantly i just say contact left and we all know the herringbone all the guns swing there i jump out every rifleman and shooter jumps out and i threw that weapon up on that freaking uh humvee and poured fire into this vehicle that was just maybe 30 feet away from us uh, across this canal. And my heavy gun happened to have, smartly, no t and &E, uh, so he could free gun. And he just pointed right at it on that butter butterfly trigger and he exploded them and uh, the, the three men behind him. And the, uh, the, the roof or the, the hood of the vehicle flew in the air in the smoke and in slow motion. And because of that, I saw the other insurgents with weapons staring up at it. And then I was able to start smoking them and we chopped our way through there, um, chopped our way past the bridge. And, you know, we're lucky to live, killed our enemy. And my brother platoon was immediately sent out to go get in a gunfight there and they did, we lost. Um, their commander was killed. Uh, my, best, my best dearest student, he lost both of his arms from a direct uh, hit with the RPG. Everybody was wounded. Eric, my, my best friend was wounded. Uh, I call, we had to get called right back in the fight. Uh, I, I was exhausted. We killed 35 insurgents and they were wearing tricolor deserts and some of them had m4s and this is from the convoys they'd been hitting for that year since i'd left the invasion and um after that it was just uh i am there as a destroyer and a predator and how i'm going to do that is keep my team super sharp super hard we're gonna train all the time and fight all the time until we're back in the United States soil. So that kind of set the tone. When when you got out of the Marine Corps, this was something that, that you were saying before we started recording. When you came back, there was a, a very short lapse in time before you know you're you're working and really no time to process everything that you had just experienced. Yeah, yeah. Well, brother, that's so interesting. How are we to know that we're supposed to process anything? <sighs> we didn't know anything back then, right? I mean, courses of discussion that we talk about now that are you know, common knowledge, we did not have any understanding of because we were so heavy in warfare and insulated in a culture of aggression and warfare. Um, all I could imagine was, I've got it all going for me. I'm a recovering team leader. I've got a freaking stack of medals, you know, and I'm supposed to be the baddest dude on the planet. So civilian life can't be that hard. <laughs> so, um, I, I didn't, I had no idea even what that was like. So I just immersed myself in work, but only within a month I started exhibiting violent tendencies. 
and then started getting in fights. I, I, I broke this man's arm on the freaking beach for talking to me rudely. I didn't understand at all how to turn it off. I felt afraid every single moment, every single day. Um, there was loud music one time outside the house and I was married at the time. And by the way, this is when I started just leaving my marriage, leaving everything. I had no connection to nothing back here. Uh, I went outside to tell the people that were playing music loud. It was at nighttime with my freaking samurai sword. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I was just, uh, I, I, I didn't even realize some of these things were happening in my behavior. Um, and when I snapped that man's arm on the beach, is freaking uh, snap like a chicken bone. And the poor young man was just saying, by then he was going, I'm over it, dude. I'm over it, like in shock. The police, or the, the police on the beach came, both were Marines. They let me go, they told me to get on out of there. And I just continued to be a workaholic. Soon I started drinking at night to go to sleep. Um, and I was obsessed with fight with martial arts. And then I started training hard in jujitsu on top of my kickboxing. And I was a loose cannon and, and a workaholic. And, I, and then I, I threatened this father and son for taking my parking space. And my wife was in the car at the time and she started crying and you know, she'd never seen me like this. And it was after that, I decided to go to the VA. And back then brother, you know what they said to us? They said, you don't have a problem. You're okay. Here's some medication. I tried the medication for a week. It was so, it dulled me. And of course I had that ch chip on my shoulder that I can't, I can't take treatment of any sort. I didn't know what to do. So I just continued to work, work, work and leave my family be home, uh, uh, leave my family behind. And then thank God when Generation Kill called, they gave me something to do and to get the hell away from the United States. The US, I, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, uh, I, I was not coping well uh, being home. Can you walk me through the, the eventual process that, yes. that helped you heal? You know, after, it's so interesting that what people call success, well, what on the surface looks like success, you got to be careful about that. Um, what our society says on the surface is success. I start. I was working. I'm. I, I've got some notoriety. I've got. I've made more money. I've made ten times more money reenacting a war with freaking espresso. And uh, you know. I made five times, I mean, I made so much money in comparison to what I was doing fighting for my country. And now it's, now there's parties, there's chicks, soon there's cocaine. I think I was just uh, continuing trying to cover up. And, um, and then I would work doing film or television. Uh, eventually I went, went to fighting for the government again and contract from both stateside teaching and training high level bomb squads to go fight overseas. And then I started doing counterterrorism in Northeast Africa. Um, in a sense, doing work with the gun and being aggressive made me feel better and calm. I wouldn't drink and I didn't do drugs whenever I was operating. But when I was home, I started, I, I eventually got a serious cocaine habit and isolated, I isolated myself. I would only show up for work and be what people wanted me to see. Um, I was in bad relationships or completely cold to people that loved me, pushed away my little brothers, uh, moved to New York City. To, again, I can, looking back, I see it all. I was running away from everything because it was too much and I didn't know how to cope. Uh, eventually, I was, um, I was put into a mental institution for guys like me. Uh, for a year, the Veterans Village of San Diego. And believe it or not, it really didn't help at all. It was a respite. I got clean. Um, I started smoking cigarettes crazy because I was so freaked out. Most of the people in the program 
if they'd even graduated or went to boot camp, they raided to go to the program. Most of them were from prison, almost all of them street drug addicts and criminals. And I was with some of the scum of the earth and I'm in a barracks in general population, scumbags. Uh, you know, people ODing in there. Uh, and I was, I mean, there was a few nights I just cried in the mirror. I said, you know, what the fuck happened to you? You know, and, and you want to talk about depression. So much depression. Um, I have a beautiful daughter and son, both uh, born when I was fighting overseas. Um, and... I, I lost the ability to see my son because I was so violent. Um, and my record was used against me. I'd never been to court before. I've never been arrested. I went to court, dressed nice, but I didn't know how to do the court proceedings. And, and when the judge was talking and I didn't like what he was saying, I said, hold. That doesn't go over too well, by the way. All you hard charges out there going into family court, let me tell you. Learn from my mistake. Do not tell the judge, hold. All right. Uh, it did not go well for me. Uh, I spent an exorbitant amount of money on lawyers. Didn't see my son forever. Then eventually could only see him. He was the love of my life. His name's Dylan. Uh, I got to raise him until he was three, four, and intermittently between missions. Um, I treated his mom bad, but she treated, I mean, we were both doing a lot of cocaine too. Uh, and, um, and I, uh, I, when they took my son away, that was the catalyst for life and death. I always had weapons with me and, um, I had been up for a few days crying and drinking and uh, what I would do, I would just get, you know, vodka and cocaine and just stay by myself at this beautiful warehouse place in Kansas City. But my room was completely enclosed and dark. And I would just listen to music and watch documentaries and just isolate myself. And then I was, uh, I felt so very useless, I was gonna kill myself. So um, I, I picked up my pistol and then I just, and I believe I put it to my head. And then I just felt this voice, not in words, but this voice, like, it's gonna be okay. And put the pistol down. So I put the pistol down. I had this voice telling me it's gonna be okay. And I called my little brother, Caesar, And uh, I said, Caesar, I need you to come over and I need you to get these guns out of here. And uh, that's what he did. And uh, I sobered up by a few days later and started working out hard and, and started believing maybe there's a reason to live and that I'm going to do anything and everything to see my son. And shortly after that, I had a job in New York City or a meeting, an audition, I think. So I had no money. And a man I'd worked with in production, uh, J uh, James Ritteroff, Jim, he lives here in Charleston. Uh, he saw me on the street and, you know, I look back at the pictures of me back then. I was so thin and gaunt, yet I was still training all the time. It's just, I, I never ate, I never slept. Uh, and he could tell I wasn't doing well. And he invited me to Cayman Islands to go diving. And I've never been diving except combat diving, right? So he brought me to Cayman Islands. Oh, by the way, I had no money. He bought me a ticket. I spent a week in the reefs and looking at the gorgeous animals and vital and clean and sober. And I brought my sore neck center mass bell with me so I could train out there. And I was so revitalized. And then at the bar, having some rum with Jim and, and my other co-founder, uh, Coast Guard, legend rescue swimmer, Keith Song, they told me that these reefs are being destroyed by by, by anchors from the massive shipping and, uh, and cruise line industry and by, uh, by climate change. And, and I think as a way of like saving my brothers, of loving and saving my son. 
uh, like signing up for the Marine Corps to fight for my country and save those orphans in, in Kosovo. That same feeling hit me. And I said, then I've got to save this. We've got to do something about this. And that is how Force Blue started. We didn't even know what we were going to call it, but Jim, it hit a freaking light bulb. Keith saw him. Um, in the next week, we had a logo. We didn't know what we were going to do, but we had a logo. And that was seven years ago, six years ago, full nonprofit, singing and dancing for a bunch of rich dudes who are assholes to get $10 here or there. And somehow, some way, I called the best operators and my friends to come on pro bono to do our first mission. Roger Sparks being the first person I called. He's my legendary recon Marine uh, mentor, instructor. And then he went to pararescue and he's the highest decorated pararescue of all time. He's an author, he's a tattoo artist. Uh, he's just a profound human being. I recommend you try to get him on your podcast. Profound, he's in Alaska, so the time difference is a little uh, different, but he is uh, magnanimous. And, um, and we did this thing and we scrabbled some money together to do a production subsurface and document it. And then we went on the circuits of some small film festivals. Uh, now we rebuild coral reefs. We grow coral at depth, replant them with epoxy. We have saved massive coral heads after the hurricanes of, of, um, of uh, Puerto Rico for months. Uh, we, we've done ocean cleanups. We, we save turtles. We rescue turtles and get them to hospital. We do anything and everything now to be a part of the solution. And what's most important is that we have a private business, NFL and Pepsi, you might've heard of them. They are our, our business partners, right? We spent immense amount of time in Washington, D.C. to enact legislature. So my men get paid by the federal and um, state government of Florida to do the work and Force Blue takes care of their travel and our, our billeting, uh, we've brought together private business, recon marines, pararescue men, SEALs, Royal Marine Commandos, uh, Green Berets, Rangers, um, Clo uh, CCT, uh, Combat Controllers, and then the last part, the science community. And at first, the science community, these true blue Speaking green, blue, uh, liberal warriors for the sea. At first, they didn't like us, right? They're like, "Who are these freaking badasses here that are uh, that are so dominant under the water? Like they're doing five times what we can do, and and they used to destroy this place. What you know? But now our science community and Force Blue and the, the operators, we are close, like a platoon." We are so close and we see that there's vitality and validation in all people that want to contribute. Doesn't matter politically, doesn't matter uh, religion, doesn't matter race. It, we are on the same boat. It doesn't matter if you get on the left side or the right side, the front or the back. And that is why we are so successful. We've been at the Super Bowl for the last three Super Bowls. Uh, Geico makes our commercials. We're fully funded. We, we don't have to sing and dance anymore. We've got a great board, General Tom Mulliken. We have all kinds of badass seals on our board. Uh, we are uh, self-sustainable now, uh, but we had to start from nothing. And as I healed through Force Blue, uh, my health, my vitality, then I met Jade Struck four years ago. The first time my heart is truly open and I'm healed enough, to be of uh, 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 to, to to be present, and we've been together ever since. And I was still sometimes struggling with drugs and alcohol. Sometimes I was still depressed. And since being with her, I I have healed so much that I'm clean and and I'm uh, and I'm strong and I'm hopeful. Then my career came back when everybody lost everything from COVID. I've been working more than ever. Thanks to the UK, thanks to SAS Who Dares Wins, thanks to, to Billy Billingham and Jason Fox and, and Remy Adelecki and, and my whole production staff, John Kahn and uh, the brothers and sisters at Minnow and Channel 4. Now we got picked up by Fox. 
So I'm going to be doing it in America. I'm, I'm going to be doing it abroad, but with American audiences. Um, it all was because first uh, I felt God tell me that it's going to be okay. And I've had a hard time with God my whole life because as a little boy, I prayed and nothing happened except more pain. But now looking back, I realized that this, the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, that example has been there the whole time to give me the, 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 the strength, the fortitude, the hope um, to not give up. And and uh, now I'm very, I, I'm, I'm going deeper and deeper into my faith, into my Christian faith. Um, I study a lot of Jordan Peterson. Uh, Jay reads the Bible every morning. I just ordered my first Bible. It's been very slow for me because when you're a man or woman that's used to providing it for themselves and, and when you accomplish such heavy things in combat, and in life, um, you're afraid that you're afraid to believe that you can trust anybody else to help you because you don't want to get let down. And I think that's why a lot of people struggle with God, whether they're Buddhist, you know, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, uh, Jewish. Uh, I think that's the, the hardest struggle there. Um, but. But, you know, it's been a progression, brother. It wasn't an overnight thing. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I uh, suspected that we were going to go in this direction because I, I know that the audience is made up of, you know, first responders, uh, fire department, law enforcement, a lot of them veterans. Um, I know that I've got active duty military that that listen and you know one of the topics that I, I like to discuss with with men and and women but men like you that have done so much for this country given so much of yourself and and found yourself in a dark place there is a a, a way out of that dark place there is and, and and it's not just a, a wham bam thank you man go to this uh, retreat and you're good or go to five therapy sessions and you'll be good to go uh, it, it's constant you know it you, is it's it, as we manicure our character and, and through manicuring character you must manicure your vehicle that we go through life with um, there, it becomes absolutely apparent the connection to God. Because when you, uh, finally we have our base needs and even auxiliary needs met. And then one day, every man and every woman will lay down in their comfortable bed. Whether they have their animals, like my kitty cat's pants, sleeps in this arm, Jade sleeps in this arm. And they will lay awake at night and they will ask themselves, what is this for? What is this for? And when you've manicured those things inside, it opens you up to understand it is so much more. There is so much more. And this is why. It is obvious to me. This is why I no longer have to ask why. There, there was something that you said earlier, um, and, I, and I actually think it was before uh, we started recording. It was, you know, you work so hard uh, to, to become this physical specimen, this, uh, you know, this operator that, that achieves high level uh, I mean, you've worked with some of the, the highest level operators in the world and you, you've achieved so many things. And then when you leave that, when you leave that world behind, who are you? Who, who is left? For sure. The identity crisis. Um, 
It, it, it is a crisis because part of you forever is this thing. But now the environment does not support this thing. And now you must adapt. We must never forget who we are, but we must adapt. And so I wanted to, uh, I, I've asked several people that I've interviewed this, this question because, you know, when I, when I left the fire department, I had that identity crisis where. So it was, wasn't just me, huh? It wasn't no, just me. No. <laughs> No, you, you know, you, you identify as this, really your job. It, it's- yeah, you identify you, as a hero. You identify as a hero and a warrior because your job is more than a job, it's a duty. You're, you're, you're really gonna, you are intentionally risking your life. And I know, Hanky, and may die in the worst possible way you know what i mean like there there was times when the machine guns are pouring in i know this is it still hey uh chafin you got fucking nine o'clock budweiser you got three let's go and um yeah there's something to that it becomes uh, part of your dna it's like not it's not like we can change clothes just because you take off your freaking uniform and then you put on another pa pair of clothing, then now you're a, a different person. It, it, you can never take it off. There is that identity crisis that occurs for so many of us. And, and some people don't figure it out and they struggle and it, yeah. it puts them in a really dark place. Well, I mean, I know I went to a really dark place and, uh, and, you know, I, I'm curious if there was, was it the diving in Grand Cayman? Was it uh, some other experience that you had that kind of helped you recenter and go, this is who I am? You know, a great student of mine, a legend, uh, became a legend recon marine, super squared away, very even killed, legend more sock operator just got out as a master gunnery sergeant, freaking massive fruit salad, jump dive, you freaking name it, sniper. Uh, took his own life after three months after uh, leaving the service. Then I understand we have had in our officer corps, which I never considered because in recon, uh, our team leaders are enlisted, and our officers, because we, we respect them so much and there's such a separation, I didn't realize that they are struggling too. Officers killing themselves or officers with extreme drug problems. Some of them are my very good friends. It is a massive sacrifice that we do. And it's also incredibly thrilling. That changes your DNA. It changes your endocrine system, your sleep. It, it changes your... Um, I uh, self-concept, your self-concept. When that self-concept no longer plugs in, it's almost like uh, you, it's almost like being in an alien world and you feel completely isolated and, and, and then um, either rage or depression or both. What was so important for me, what I can tell is the things that happened. First of all, I continued forward. It went in doubt, because I have young men and women reach out to me all the time just out of service and they're struggling. When in doubt, keep working out. When in doubt, keep working out and keep your combat skills. But remember that because it'll help ground you. If you keep working out hard, you can have a good chance of sleeping. If you have a good chance of sleeping, when you wake up, some days you're gonna actually be happy to wake up. Then you must also get into nature of some sort, hiking, I, I'm always outdoors, hiking, running, swimming, diving, you must be in mother nature. It'll start reminding you like a child, that wonderment. 
and you're building good brain chemicals because you're training. After that, with that little bit of peace, start thinking about your family members and or your school or your profession as your new platoon mates and figure out how to, you know, follow and or lead and find your way. Definitely get therapy in some sense, whatever that is. And, and the last thing that has to be talked about, you must attack your fiscal responsibility or attack your professional um, a piece of your life. You must attack it like you're in war because if you don't, um, all it takes for any of us tough guys or tough girls is a bad breakup, um, losing a job, not seeing your kid, too many drinks at night, and then it's jail or prison or suicide. We must keep working and we must, we must take care of ourselves fiscally because there's, well, at least for a man, I'll speak for myself. The lowest I had been right before I, when I was close to suicide, I had no work, I was broke, and I, and I had no support, or I, I couldn't reach for any support. Um, so that's, those precepts, you gotta use them. And for damn sure, stay in touch with your boys from the teams, um, uh, you know. Um, this social media, a lot of it now, because it's just, you know, Bernays style freaking propaganda um, salesmanship. That's what it's become. But it doesn't have to be for us. Social media, Facebook and, and Instagram or whatever, it is so vital by staying connected and seeing each other's face and effortlessly being able to video chat. Um, you must stay connected. Uh, you have to stay connected. That, that's, that's what I would say. Before we go, I, I wanted to hear a little bit about your book. Um, oh, sure. So the, the title uh, is Hero Living, Seven Strides to Awaken Your Infinite Power. Brother, well, I got this book deal when I was out of Generation Kill and I'm the new best thing. I'm on the fitness magazines and all this. They wanted me to write about my war exploits. And to this day, I'm hesitant to profit on glory where other men and women have been killed. And, and, and I work with Gold Star families now and I see the toll. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do? I'll write a self-help book. And I think about these tools that you can employ in your life, forward momentum, physical fitness, exploring your freaking uh, pain and looking at it and creating this pain into an actual cage that you see. And you think about freaking cutting down those bars, leaning into it. Of course, service, find ways of being in service. I wrote about my personal experiences and then used other magnificent philosophers and, and examples of my heroes that continue to fight the good fight. And as you can see, you know, uh, heroes are every, I got my, my Shogun warrior freaking robots up here, my action figures, I got Rocky Balboa right here. You see my, my uh, rings and, and my, uh, my parallel bars, uh, I am immersed in, in heroism, at least in my, you know, in my daily life, in my environment, to remember who I am. And so I wrote this book to help people that have gone through immense trauma. Yeah, you know, I've been through, I've been through the trauma myself, you know, and, and I, I look back at what got me through and it was a, a, an, an indomitable good attitude. An indomitable good attitude. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you got to stay motivated. And, uh, and, I, and I ran that damn motivation until I was dry. However, looking back, 
that seven years, eight years after service, even with an extreme freaking cocaine habit, intermittently between going to combat and, and being in the gun world for, uh, you know, in the private sector for my country. Um, the momentum kept, kept me moving forward enough to still have some accolades and some money so that even when I was fucked up, I could say, I did that. I did this. I did this last month. I did this yesterday. Then I can do it today. And, and, and then by then I was so tired. My heart was opening up, uh, my, uh, my heart opened up to God and I, and I, um, and I, and I let him in, you know, I only, I only just prayed for the first time like three weeks ago. Like it's been slow for me. Cause you, I told you some of my struggles are still to this day. I, um, I have a hard time letting go now of my, my self-reliance and my toughness. Um, uh, and so what that taught me over time is self-reliance. And when you've relied on yourself your whole life, um, it's hard to ask for help. And especially then to ask for the ultimate help, which is God and Jesus. I prayed to Jesus as well. Uh, it, this is a big step for me. And, uh, and I have the support structure and I'm able to vocalize that now. And it's wonderful. I find it liberating to say God and to say Jesus and to uh, and to you know look at Jade's Bible and and uh, reflect about this magnificent example. Um, and I'm dedicated my life to it. So the, and and by the way, I've got another book deal coming uh, about my life story, and I think now I'm centered enough to do it. When I wrote Hero Living. I was still in pain myself and I was writing it for me. You know what I'm saying? I was writing it for me. And, uh, and it's funny because of that little piece of work, so many great people have come into my life. Gunnar Peterson, uh, Bert Soren of Sorenex and all of the family and strength. I forgot in the back of my book, there's pictures of me in my teen years. There's almost no pictures of my childhood because I didn't have one, right? It's only a few. And I love Ian Ashbery and the cult. Uh, they were my rad band that I loved when I was in high school in my early 20s. There's a big picture of Ian in the back in my, my warehouse. And, uh, and I was in a rock and roll band too. And Ian saw Generation Kill, got my book, and then he reached out to me. And he is one of my dearest friends and mentors. And he's been through this freaking entertainment business. And he counsels me. And, um, you know, I, I have these beautiful people. Bobby Burke, who played General Mattis in Generation Kill. Rescue Me, everything. 63, still doing it. He is now a firefighter. He, his mentor, idol, older brother, died fighting and saving people in 9-11. He's a New Yorker. He is now a fire chief, brother. He went to school as an act after that. He went to school and has been on the fire department ever since. Um, I have these beautiful, amazing people. And of course, my fiance, soon to be my wife, Jade Strzok. Um, uh, I have Michael and Caesar, my little brothers back. I have my legendary special operations community and all veteran community. I do not distinguish. And I, do, I just spoke at uh, um, Deadwood, South Dakota for first responders and veterans there. And there were so many brothers and sisters from the fire department and from the police that had been through so much. And, and they're warriors and they're hurting and suffering and they were giving testimony. This is the community. I've got the greatest family and community in the world. And that's where I'm at now. That's where we met, was in Deadwood. And- uh... How rad was that, brother? What, you know what, I don't even really remember my talk because I was so moved by everybody else out there. Um, I had a talk to give, and then I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share 
a little bit about myself and my testimony. And I hope that the audience can relate because I, I have, a, after reading the room and, and listening to everybody and talking to everybody, I knew they could relate. Yeah, that was, uh, that was powerful that night. There was so much energy there. You know, I, I, I was able to go to a retreat last year. That's how I got involved with Sacred Mountain. And it, it changed my life. And Brother, how about this? I am taking my right-hand man, Stone Cold Killer, and most loving and trustworthy brother, Paul Wayman, who was once my student, um, killed more, more motherfuckers than cancer. Um, I'm taking him and me to do the, to, to the retreat. It, these are ways, uh, these, are, these are messages to oneself that it is a constant working through and, to, and a constant state of receiving. Uh, and forever I wouldn't receive, brother, because I was so angry at myself for being a failure, I thought. I want to go, and we're going to go. Awesome, Sacred man. Mountain's amazing. Blew my freaking mind. Yeah. As I'm older, you know, I'm 50 now, and really my skills are in combat and, and extremities. Um, and I have a little bit of identity crisis. I, I have a, a, a crisis now is that I'm getting old. I got my first knee surgery a year and a half ago. Thank you, Gunnar Peterson and uh, Dr. Elitrosh, the best knee surgeon in the world. Um, and, I and I couldn't walk for about three months. I couldn't run for six months. And I saw myself finally physically as human. Um, I, uh, you know, I had to do some real soul searching and, and, and accepting the gospel into me has only invited, it's invigorated me, it's empowered me. And because that character has to be number one, I make the right decisions, you know? Um, I, I, I have to say no to some of my freaking boys when they wanna go out and party. And they are my freaking teammates that we freaking slaughtered bodies with. Uh, um, I've gotta say no to environments in which, you know, because and my, my fiance is beautiful and sexy. If we go to bars, there's gonna be a problem, trust me. You know what I mean? I have two or three or five. And some, it's going to be a problem. So we only go to restaurants. So you got to manicure that character. And then you find that you're so empowered by the gospel to do that. The book that you're writing, do you have a title for it yet? N not, not yet. Not yet. It's, it's kind of in the early stages. Um, but of course, the publishers, uh, I mean, you know, it's very interesting. They know that now that I am the chief instructor of of SAS Who Dares Wins, which is the most honorable um, film job I've ever had in my life. Uh, and I'm gonna be doing this for years to come. Uh, you know, can, there's gonna be talk a, a big audience. About, What's can that? Talk, can you talk a little bit about sure. that project? Uh, you can check it out on Amazon right now, but soon it'll be on Fox. It's been around five or six years. Legend SAS, uh, 33 years. British Army SAS, Billy Billingham, 25 years SBS, um, Jason Fox, uh, uh, the, the real root of the freaking show. It is a human revelation show masquerading as a military selection process. So we run people through selection. People from trauma, people from struggle, professional athletes, everybody. Um, put them through their paces. Kidnap them, put them through freaking POW training, uh, break them down to the raw essential to help them um, break through. And it is incredible. Uh, I just shot two seasons and I've got more to go. Uh, you'll, you all in America are going to be seeing me all over the place pretty soon. Um, and uh, and it's just, in, and I'm ready for this now. So now the book deals and the movie deals, everything's coming. I am taking it slow. I'm taking it slow, brother. And that show, 
the the listeners right now they could go on amazon and find it oh they're gonna be blown away brother and wait till they see the badasses billy billingham and jason fox these studs and you know they're my age and older and funny and exotic because they're british by the way they think i'm exotic right when i go over there billy billingham they let uh, jason fox go he goes billy billingham from birmingham because he's from birmingham and you know uh, they, they, it's Birmingham, you know, and, and, uh, I had to read something one time about Cheshire and then Fox, he started laughing and he goes, it's Cheshire. Anyway, I'm a big laugh over there, brother, but, uh, I'm very honored. And I guess the show is so badass. I travel to London in a month with the missus, uh, to go to the premiere and do the uh, press junket for all the news shows. And, uh, and you all in America are, will be hearing from Fox very soon. Now, if people want to follow you, connect with you, um, read more about you, like I know they can Google you, find your Wikipedia, find your website. I'm gonna have links uh, awesome. in the show notes. Um, if they wanted to buy your book. Yes. Amazon, baby. Get on that Amazon. And you know what's so funny, brother? I don't make any money on it. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about business deals and contracts back then. But the message is so good. I'm selling more now than ever, which makes me happy. Uh, get on my Instagram because I, I changed my phone number. I'm still locked out of my Facebook. I'll eventually get on online. But you know what I'd like to say? When you make yourself and your work so freaking powerful, people will find you. And Rudy Reyes is a pretty common Mexican name. But brother, when you type in that Rudy Reyes on that Google, I'm the first cat that comes up. Most importantly, forcebluteam.org. Get on forcebluteam.org and see my work now. For those out there that would like to get involved with Force Blue, is there... Uh, a mechanism for people to get involved Absolutely. or support? Absolutely. You can, of course, we need donations. Uh, you can buy our sweatshirts and t-shirts and every veteran. Now we have this work through the DOD and the VA uh, through uh, um, the GI Bill. They can go to school for their advanced scuba. Then they come to us for follow-on training and, and they become force blue assistant science divers and they can deploy with us. So we've had many come. It, it doesn't matter what your MOS was. It doesn't matter if you were a mechanic, if you were a administrative person or a military police, you can come getting involved because we've got missions going on everywhere. We've got one in the kelp forest. We've got one in Florida. That's for the next four years. At least we're looking at Hawaii and also, um, uh, Timor Islands. Um, yes, you, you can get involved and, 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 the, and, and we'll have a place for you to do that. Well, I'll have all those links in the show notes. Um, before awesome. we go. And one more thing. And one more thing. I did an incredible veteran powered film last year. It's a detective show. It's a, it's a horror show. It's a family show. Um, and it's beautifully done by, by Stephen Graham and I've got some other outstanding veterans, uh, Don McAllister, legend, uh, uh, Airborne Command Sergeant Major, and Nate Boyer, Green Beret, and was a professional football player. They're in the cast as well. Um, it's, called the Se it's called The Secret of Sanchani, and it's on Tubi, and I think it's on a couple other platforms. Uh, put, put a link onto that and, and drive some people to that film. All right, will do. Before we go, is there, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything uh, that you can think of that um, you would like to share with the audience be before we go? I would like to share that there is a way forward and it's only getting better. When you start that first step, you'll be surprised. There's thousands waiting to, to help you out. There's thousands that love you and are praying for your success and happiness. Just take that first step forward. Amen, brother.
Thanks, my man. Yeah, thank you very much, Rudy. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them. And the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.